Yeah, we don't have a lot of time left today. We might even end a, a couple of minutes early if we, you know, if we run out of material. But what we wanted to do was talk a little bit about some of the things that we see that are uh, kind of humorous. I mean, my God, if you didn't laugh at this, you'd have to cry or kill yourself. There's no, no other alternatives. I've been in therapy. I've, I've worked in uh, public accounting now for 36 years. I've been in therapy for 32. So, you know, I don't think it'll end until 12 years after I retire. But we see, you know, in, in light of all of these complexities, these ugly little technical aspects of things that you've seen all day through accounting changes, accounting developments, uh, and especially on the tax side, we've seen a lot of kind of funny things, and we've seen some cases that we thought you might enjoy some of the things we've bumped into along our way. My earliest experience with a, a catastrophic tax case was accompanying an individual went years ago, I worked at one of the big four firms, and he was being challenged on a number of deduct medical deductions to uh, his, his return. And, and I mean, when I say substantial, I think the guy's adjusted gross income was maybe $80,000, and his medical expenses were like $130,000. So we go into the office in Pittsburgh, uh, and we're, we're, we're walking in. Well, the first thing that happened was I was, I was going to meet him downstairs to go, he was in a cab because he couldn't walk the day that I happened to see him. He was on crutches. I'd seen this guy for like three years. I'd never seen him on crutches. But that day, he was on crutches. And as we walk into the examiner's office, he catches the crutch on the side of the water cooler, falls down, hits his head on the wall. Everybody in the whole IRS office is scrambling around him. And don't you know, they just, they just kind of let him go. They didn't want to hang out and deal with the guy who, who had actually fallen. Nobody knew, I swear, till today that this, this particular individual had uh, staged that whole event, but who knows, <laughs> okay? We had another taxpayer one time, this was at uh, Gross Mechanic Ford many, many years ago, who, who made about $60,000, but wanted to take a tax deduction for $4,000 for donation of 800 pairs of used socks. <laughs> now, my wife is always moaning about my closet, but I've never seen, I, I'm not sure how you can accumulate 800 pairs of used socks, so. And then the last one, I, I just tell you, I think it's kind of humorous, is kind of on trade or business expenses. And, and what we really uh, ran into was a guy that had a lot of football parties with his friends, football game parties, mostly Steeler games. And he was in the party planning business. So he basically deducted all the expenses associated with watching these games with his friends. And he did ultimately get examined and not only uh, paid the tax back, he had to pay a lot of penalties and interest as well. So, you know, we see those comical things and, and, and you wonder, you know, what, what the process is that makes somebody go so far in, in using the law. A lot of it has to do with the complexity, right? I mean, what's more daunting, even for you guys who are accountants and numbers people by trade, than trying to pull together your tax returns in the spring? You have a 70,000 page internal revenue code. You have thousands and thousands of more pages of, of different items that, that support those tax positions. You have revenue rulings, private letter rulings, revenue procedures, uh, IDRs, all kinds of different types of documents that you need to look at in conjunction with preparing it. So the complexity itself, especially to laymen, I think makes them feel like, you know, they've paid enough and they paid their due. And then you have this overriding theoretical concept that, you know, the wealthy don't pay enough and the lower class or lower income people pay too much, so people take their liberties in, in trying to do that. And that's kind of the basis on which a lot of this is, is, is based on today. You know, we talk about uh, the taxpayer, and I think in the, in the written materials you see the comment by President Reagan, which I think is, is really apropos, which, where he defines the taxpayer, that, that's simply someone that works for the U.S. government that doesn't have to take the civil service exam. So th there's a lot of truth to that. And, and when you look at, look at how people found the way they look at the tax system, and, and when you really think about the fact that this tax system in particular is a compliance-oriented, voluntary compliance system, it's amazing that we do as well as we do. In putting together things, when you go and you start to look at these cases, and Michael's going to go over the cases in a moment as we go through these different avenues, the thing to keep in mind is, is again, the comments that are in the materials. Nobody has a responsibility to, to plan their, their taxes in any other manner than to minimize them to the lowest level possible under the law, right? And I assume that most of the people in this room do that. 
that not necessarily being aggressive, but you're certainly going to take advantage of every opportunity that's offered under the, uh, under the law. And this, this Judge Learned Hand, who served on the, on the appellate courts of New York until 1951, I believe it was, he, he would comment on that constantly because in the cases that you see, and these are spouted out in law schools all the time and in any tax program, graduate school program, uh, this idea that you only have to pay the minimum, what, what's actually required under the law. So that quote, I think, and I, and, and I read from him, over and over, courts have said that there's nothing sinister in so arranging one as affairs as to keep his taxes as low as possible. You know, everybody does that, the rich, the poor, and they're all doing it right, for nobody owes, and this is an important rule, nobody owes any public duty to pay more than the law demands. You know, taxes are enforced exactions, they're not voluntary contributions, and furthermore, to demand more in the name of morals is, is mere cant. And I think that's great, because where did we see this recently? We see this in Donald Trump's media presentation of his tax returns. And I'm not suggesting that Donald Trump's tax returns are accurate or that this individual has taken the positions that don't break the law. I, I have no idea. I've never seen it. But I do know that he is allowed to take advantage of whatever the law affords. And if he took a $1 billion loss, which is what the word is, then, you know, supposedly, if he, if he did it correctly, he took a deduction that was allowed under the law. And because of at-risk rules, because of passive activity rules, other basis rules, the assumption is somewhere along the line, he, he poured a million dollars into an entity or a billion dollars into an entity to take those losses. So I'm not saying that he did everything in a kosher manner. I'm saying unless we had more evidence, more information, it's hard to take the position that the guy's a crook simply because of the, the fact that his return showed this billion dollar loss. So it's just one more example, I think, in the media of, of where you run into these situations where you, you, you drive into uh, a circumstance, if you will, where people misinterpret what the law says. And that's not hard to do because of the, the breadth of the law and the complexity of the law. So when we're looking at taxes and we're trying to determine how we're going to do this and, 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 and put our tax returns together, as well as for our clients, we start with, with these three fundamental concepts. And the first one is that every single item of income, everything, is taxable, no matter what, unless there's a specific statutory provision that allows you to not include it. So that drives back to a code section in the, in the code, section 61, which says income is, is any economic gain from whatever source derived. So you cannot basically exclude anything unless you have a, an actual statutory provision. And when we're teaching young professionals at our firm how to do tax returns, that's a big bone of contention with me, a big point I'm always trying to hammer is understand why the numbers are what they are and where does the statutory scheme allow for that presentation on the tax return so that it's in compliance. The second rule is that nothing is deductible. Every single thing is, there, is, is disallowed, again, unless there is a specific exemption. So it should be a little more cut and dry than people suspect because you should have a specific exemption capability to be able to put you in a position to justify the deduction. You know, I don't expect you guys to know, but you know, 163H for mortgage interest deductions. So there's a reason for it. It's not just because it was on last year's tax return. It has a statutory legal reason to drive that. And then finally, the last one is that expenses are deductible. They have to be incurred in connection with a trade or business. And trade or business, as you'll see in some of these cases, in some of these examples, is really a term of art. But the primary driver in the definition of a trade or business is, is absolutely that there has to be a profit motive. And a profit motive can be demonstrated any number of ways, but it isn't necessarily every case that, that a company is losing money is, is deemed something other than a trade or business, but your expenses are not going to be deductible unless you have a trade or business. And that's going to be the realm from which we take a look at these items as well. If you have this idea conceptually that everything is taxable unless there's an exclusion, then the question is, you know, income recognition and how do we deal with income recognition planning opportunities. And, and when you look at income recognition, there's really two elements of that. Since it's required under the code that you include, you know, all, all income from whatever source derived, then you have to look at 
two, two elements of planning. One is based on our accounting method, what is the timing of the income recognition? And for all of us, all individuals, we're cash basis taxpayers. So you have this timing issues, this timing of income. And then this other possibility, this excludability option, where you have certain provisions within the code that allows to exclude income. And people take a lot of liberty with both, as, as you might imagine. Uh, the second element for areas of tax planning strategy development then is this idea of trade or business, understanding what the trade or business is, that it really exists, and that the expenses that are being deducted are not only legitimate, but that they're verifiable and that they're accounted for in a proper manner. And then finally, as I said, nothing is deductible unless there's a, a specific code section that references that. You look at certain expenses that are deductible and you have to drive through where they come from. And, and when I talk about these expenses, we're basically talking about itemized expenses for the most part and maybe expenses in uh, calculating adjusted gross income. So those really are the three big key elements of any tax return, no matter how complex. And we just looked at a tax return the other day, Rick and I, that was four or 500 pages long. But at the end of the day, it's these three primary elements. So we go through there and we start to talk about timing. Let's look at some of those items and then we can talk about some of the cases. Well, you have this timing of income recognition. The issue is what happens in, in conjunction with the receipt of the income. If you have actual receipt of the income, then you're in a situation where you clearly have taxable income because that has come in in that particular time frame or that time period that's included on that tax return. If you don't have actual receipt, then the determination of whether that income is taxable falls to a doctrine called the constructive receipt doctrine. And anybody that's experienced in taxation and accounting probably has an appreciation for that term generally. But constructive receipt basically is that point in time during which, it, which the monies are, are, or, or the economic gains could be in-kind property uh, is credited to an account is set apart for you, is otherwise made available so that you can draw on it at any time, uh, so that you can draw on it during the taxable year. So it's an issue of having an availability of the income and, and, and an unfettered ability to use the income if you take it. So by, by example, I send you a check for some service that you provided for $10,000. I mail it out on December 30th. It hits your mailbox on December 31st. You decide not to pick it up until the day after New Year's and deposit it on the second, that's still taxable income in the prior year. Constructive receipt can be explained is in an example as simple as that. Do we have a case? Let's see here. Oh, before we uh, dive into some of the cases here, I just, by way of background, I guess, just so everybody knows, probably about six or eight weeks before um, CPE day actually occurs, uh, the people that are speaking get this email from Bob that says, here's the agenda for uh, CPE day this year. So I look at it, and here I'm going down the list, and at the very bottom it says, uh, here's Mike Weber, humorous look at tax planning. Now, I, I wasn't sure if that meant I was supposed to be humorous or what I was talking about was supposed to be humorous. So for the last eight weeks, my wife and I have stayed up on Saturday night and watched Saturday Night Live. And let me tell you, over the last eight weeks, it's been pretty interesting. But everybody's probably been in the same situation that I've been. They get up early, they go to work, they grind away, they come home, and then they have to face their wife, and, and she says, he or she says to them, so, so how was your day today? Oh, it went well. well so what'd you do? I said, well, I, you know, grinded away as a tax accountant. Well, well what, does it, what do you mean? You've got to be more specific. So I said, well, so lo and behold, this movie came out, The Accountant, right? So I said, why don't you just go and see that movie, and you can figure out what we do at work every day. But, <laughs> Bob, when did, when did that movie come out, though? Came out, I, I think that movie came out on October 14th. You couldn't make it, could you? I couldn't make it. No, I was stuck in the office. Actually, interestingly, Bob was on vacation that day. And um, <laughs> so Don, who's the other tax partner, rounded everybody up in the group and said, um, hey, we're just going to go and uh, pay for everybody to go to the movies this day to watch The Accountant. And I'm sure it'll be embedded on line one on Bob's K-1 under the um, ordinary and necessary business expense. Yeah. Uh, so, so my wife didn't like that too much, so she said, well, why don't you try this one on for size? I said, oh, geez, where's this going to go? She said, hey, you know, there's really only three types of tax accountants out there in the world right now. I said, oh, really? What are they? She said, uh, those that can count and those that can't count. <laughs> Maybe I need to tell that one again. I don't know. You're on a roll. <laughs> you're, you're on a roll, Mike. Keep it going. <laughs> 
there was a really interestingly titled case that I tried for weeks and weeks to try to fit into this presentation. But it was the most convoluted partnership case that there was absolutely nothing interesting about it except the title, just Batman versus the Commissioner. And I couldn't get it into this presentation. I guess it's in now. So as Bob had mentioned, this constructive receipt idea, um, there have been a number of cases on this. The first one I'm gonna talk about is uh, Walter versus the Commissioner back in 1998. The Walters were farmers in South Dakota. They uh, sold about 8,000 cattle in a year. They farmed about 2,000 acres. And uh, you know, one day they're driving in their tractor and here comes the IRS agent. He was actually wearing his overalls. And he came up to them and said, hey, you know, uh, we're gonna audit your tax return for 1985 and 1986. I said, okay, that's fine. We don't have anything to hide. So he goes through the whole process. No big issue, they make a minor adjustment. They come back in 1988, do the same thing, and they're going through all their materials and they find that there's this piece of paper that has a check removed from it, but they can't find it in the 1988 deposit. So they, they show this information to the Walters and they say, well, well, actually that related to 1986. They went through all their bank records for 1986, nothing, they couldn't find it. So they went back to the uh, customer and they reissued the check and deposited it in their account in 1988 and put it on their tax return and the IRS said, I, I don't think so. That transaction related to 1986. You have to go back and put it on that year's return. And oh, by the way, there's penalties involved in this also. So they had the, they actually had the check. So the, the taxpayers in this case actually argued that, uh, well, well, since we lost the check, we didn't really have it. So um, when we actually had control over it, that was 1988. And so that's the year that the income should be reported. The IRS said, and actually the tax court agreed with them and they said, no, that's really not the way that that, that works out. You are the one who created the issue limitation on the check, so it has to be reported in 1986. Yeah, there's a lot of constructive receipt cases that come from planning for cash basis taxpayers, including cash basis businesses where they, they decide as a business not to do their billings in December. If you don't do your billings in December, you're certainly not going to get uh, the collections in December, so that's one way to do that. The service in those instances won't come in and basically uh, realign that in most instances. I've never seen them try to do that. But the, the very thought process that you would defer your billing just to save the tax liability is probably not the wisest economic move when, when you get into that circumstance. Where the cases continue to pop up, and we see them all the time, they, they come out, you see a case on constructive receipt regularly, and uh, at least four, five, six times a year. And it's always, almost always a situation where I call you, I say, hey, Bill, I have the check. It's on my desk. And you're like, yeah, I'll be down to get it. And, and you wait from December 15th to January 3rd to pick up that money, thinking you're not going to uh, recognize that. The stymie on the other side, though, is the situation where very often the corporate payor is going to basically take a deduction for that number in that prior calendar year, especially if they're on a cash basis accounting uh, I'd say both bases of account, both methods, but they're going to take a deduction and issue a 1099 anyway. So the fact that you didn't pick it up, a lot of the early constructive receipt abuses that the IRS saw uh, have kind of gone the wayside simply because of the 1099 reporting requirements are so, are so difficult and complex and basically so encompassing that there's not as much of a, an abuse as there used to be. The second case we have in this area is this Santangelo case back from 2014. These constructive receipt cases are actually not all that interesting or humorous. They're kind of just, you know, they, they illustrate the actual concepts that Bob's talking about here. And, uh, Mrs. Santangelo uh, had bought stock in a company back in 1971. The, uh, the company merged with another company and the stock split a few times. And, 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 and when, when the merger occurred, uh, everybody was paid $51 a share for their stock, but you had to actually present the certificate or you could go through this process to uh, you know, say, hey, look, I don't have the certificate and there was a process to actually get the money there. Um, and that happened in 2006. So our kids kind of find out about this and they say, oh yeah, we need to go and you know, redeem all this money. It ended up being $1.1 million. And uh, unfortunately for Mrs. Santangelo, she passed away in 2007. 
the stock was or the certificates were not turned in and the process was not followed to obtain the money even without their certificate till 2008, 2009. So they wanted to put the income on the estate return and the IRS came in and said, they basically blew it away and said, again, you've had constructive receipt of this income, you know, at the time the merger occurred, which was in 2006. So there are a number of cases out in the divorce arena that, that kind of mimic and, and run off of tax issues, uh, you know, a, a situation where uh, people are getting divorced or separated. Uh, the wife swings by the house in the afternoon, takes the checks out of the mail, doesn't give them to the husband. He doesn't reflect it as income on his tax return next year because they filed married, filing separate. Uh, two years later, you find out she has the checks. They've never been cashed. They're now stale dated. And, and an issue of constructive receipt arises in that situation. And th there's a Murray case out there. It's, it's probably seven or eight years old now. In that case, the, the court still ruled that even though the wife took the check, it, it was in the mailbox, and so the receipt of that in the mailbox made that taxable. Now, I don't know who paid the tax, the wife or the husband, uh, and I don't know who got the money in the end, but it's, it's an interesting thing that he didn't have control over that even though the check was made to him, she actually took the check. So, so the final case in this area is the uh, Davis case. This one's, I guess, slightly more interesting. Uh, Mrs. Davis was fired from her job um, in uh, the later part of 1974. So she was waiting on her, um, they gave her, they fired her, gave her a severance package. And uh, so she's waiting on the check to come and we're all the way at, at the uh, end of December. She's waiting and waiting on the check and she says, yeah, I know it's coming. So I'm just gonna go out to the store. She, I think the case said she was at the Louis Vuitton store or something, I don't, maybe she saw my wife there, I'm not sure. But uh, so she comes home and, and finds this note on her mailbox that says, uh, Look, we tried, to, we tried to deliver this letter to you as a certified letter. We tried to deliver it. Nobody's here. Uh, the note said, stop by the post office around three, before 3 o'clock. That's when we close. You can pick up your check. Uh, she came home at 5 o'clock and went down to the post office. They were closed, so she didn't get the check until January. And in that case, they actually, the court actually ruled that she could defer that income into the next year because she didn't create that limitation on accepting that income. She didn't actually have control of it. Yeah, so it, what's interesting is it goes exactly against that Murray case where the check was actually in the mailbox and they, they made her pick it up. So the issue, though, overall is this conceptual idea that if you have unfettered opportunity to have that money, then you're going to, you're going to have to pick it up as income and recognize it. On the excludability of income side, most of the time that has to do with, again, statutory provisions that allow for the exclusion uh, by virtue of the nature or character of the expenditure in the first place. Health care, not, really not really an issue if an employer pays health care. There are specific code provisions that allow you to exclude that from both uh, earned income as well as your self-employment or social security income. I should say social security, not self-employment. So that's one area. The other area of excludability depends on, uh, that, that we see a lot, it has to do with settlements of lawsuits. You're in an accident, uh, there's a certain amount of settlement that's paid for the damages to, to the vehicle. If it's a vehicle accident, some of it's allocated to lost wages, some of it's allocated to pain and suffering, and perhaps even mental anguish. And, and the actual physical uh, part of it is going to be excludable from, from taxes, the pain and suffering compensation, as well as the mental anguish from the physical. But we, we've seen bizarre cases where we, we see a biker gang burning down a bar and, and so the, bar, the bartender gets a settlement of whatever it is. I, I think it was like $400,000, and this is a local case. The individual allocates 80% of the, of the proceeds to mental anguish. He was off that night. He wasn't there. So it wasn't caused by any physical injuries. And 20% of the settlement, because his lawyer structures the settlement that way, is to the, build, is to the burn down of the bar plus the, the lost profits for however many months they were closed. So it's an interesting thing. The service looks at that right away and says, that's absurd, comes in and reallocates it based on bringing engineers in. And so it ended up almost flipping the other way, 20% for mental anguish, which was includable in income anyway because he hadn't been physically harmed. Do you have any other cases on uh, excludability? No, that's it. Okay. The other case I would say real quick, like on health care, we had a, a, a company, this was not our case, but a case we helped another firm with. Uh, they, this was several years ago as well where the health care expenses paid by the employer, of course, are not deductible or are not includable in the recipient employee's things. But this guy was, it was an oil and gas guy, this big brute of a guy. I think he weighed 
You know, he's like Paul Bunyan, 270 pounds, like 6'4", no fat on him. Well, he liked to go to the spa and get pedicures. And the company paid for the pedicures for this guy for years. And they would run like ten or $12,000 through. And one of the adjustments going through the corporate return just happened to be these health expenses that couldn't be justified. We started getting all these invoices for pedicures. And obviously what happened is it got pulled into the guy's income. So that's how that went. Uh, the, the deductions are where people take more liberties, it seems, uh, both from the trader business perspective as well as the itemized deductions and others. So we'll start real quick talking a little bit about trader business. And as I said, trader business characterization to pull you out of what's known as the home hobby rules or the hobby loss rules under Section 183 requires that you have a profit motive. So the way they, they define it, and you would think for as important a term as that is, trader business in the Internal Revenue Code, that it would be defined somewhere, but it really is not positive, positively defined anywhere. But it's been found through a lot of case law, through the regulations and so forth, to be an activity that is, quote unquote, continuous and regular, meaning it has a continuity of enterprises you're doing it. It's motivated with that profit incentive that you're out to make a profit, the profit motive, uh, that the expenses that you're deducting are ordinary and necessary expenses which come under the guise of, of Code Section 162. So those are the kind of, ex of items that we see. And, and the thing that happens, you say, well, it should be pretty straightforward. Most of you that draw a salary from a company have, have a sense of what the trader business is of that company, and you, and you kind of have a sense in your mind of what a trader business is. But if you look at page, uh, I have page six. I must have missed. You know what 11, page it is? The listing of uh, the, the, under understanding oh. trades or businesses, examples of businesses that have been slammed by the IRS over time, because I don't think we have a slide on that. And, and that's you know you can see it's got everything from artists, musicians, and writers, and, and the deductions of their expenses to airplanes. We've seen people with automotive racing. Uh, one of our clients now was, was a big-time drag racer, spent tons of money in that area. Cattle ranching, charter fishing, dance company, real estate, leasing, timber activity, horse-related is a big one here. We see lots of clients with horse-related businesses and dog breeding. So those are the kind of things that they come in and they have an issue with and that they challenge. And you'll see when we look at some of these deductions and some of these cases, how creative people can get because this is... You know, when you say horse breeding, you say, okay, I can see how somebody could make that argument. But listen to this case. Yeah, this well, is my favorite. Well, before we get into this case, I, there was a couple um, additional cases that I had read about that didn't make it into today's materials. But everybody, uh, one question we get all, not all the time, but some of the time we get it. You know, can I take any deduction for any of my pets? Well, no, you, you, know, you can't do that, except for in a situation where you would have a business actually that has a guard dog outside, so like a farm. So in one instance, a, a guy wanted to deduct all the expenses related to purchasing the dog and the upkeep and the food and everything, and they went through the whole process. And that kind of made sense to me until I found out that his dog was a poodle. <laughs> so, so the IRS disallowed that one. A junkyard poodle. Yeah. <laughs> there, was a also, uh, actually, a there was also a furniture store here in, uh, in Pittsburgh that uh, burned to the ground. Uh, the, the, um, the business tried to take a casualty deduction, which we're going to talk about uh, in a little bit. But so the IRS audited that, and they said, "Now we're going to we're going to disallow that uh, that casualty loss because this was a, this fire was actually started by an arsonist." And they questioned the guy's return. They said, "Well, what's this consulting fee on here for a hundred thousand bucks?" He said, "Oh, that's what I paid the guy to burn down my store." <laughs> Try to deduct that also. So. This green case actually is Bob. Hey, Mike, Mike, ask, ask me what's, what's the most important thing about being a good comedian. Just ask that question. What's the most important Timing. thing? Timing. <laughs> Go ahead, sorry to throw you. This green case is actually pretty interesting. Uh, Mrs. Green actually was, uh, was a blood donor, and she wanted to turn this into a business. She actually had the... Uh, rare AB negative blood. I don't know, I only had one earth science class in college, so I'm not exactly sure what that means. But when you pick up your certificates today, we are gonna have a blood drive down there. They're gonna tell you what your blood type is, so if you are AB negative, you're 0.6% uh, of the population, so you'll be starting a business on Monday and my business card's out there. This person actually continuously drove to a blood um, 
donation center, and, and the center actually uh, purchased her uh, the, the plasma, I guess, and uh, she wanted to deduct all the expenses related to keeping her body in shape. She wanted to deduct her car expenses. She wanted to deduct her travel expenses. She wanted to deduct vitamins and uh, protein. Uh, there was some type of special drugs, her medical insurance. There were illegal items involved in this. And the IRS came in and they, they wanted to uh, disallow all these deductions with the thought being that this really isn't a trade or business. They went through the whole process and she actually went there um, you know, several times uh, a year for seven years. So it met that threshold of, you know, systematic, continuous, regular. So it actually was a trade or a business, and so all these expenses related to it were actually um, allowed as a deduction. Interestingly, though, in this case, um, well, there was two interesting items, actually. One, in deducting her travel expenses, partly the argument the IRS made was that her commuting to the blood donation center was actually a, a you know, personal commuting expenses. And she actually won that argument because she, she argued that she couldn't extract her own blood and actually ship it in. She actually was the container, so she was able to deduct all of her travel expenses. It's unbelievable. And, and, and get this one, she actually tried to take a depletion expense for losing all the minerals out of her blood. And if you read the case, there's like two sentences on there and the, and the tax court says, yeah, no. Where's Rebecca? What's the depletion section, Beck? I mean, that's, that's kind of an interesting thing. It, they limit it to what? To geophysical minerals. Yes, yeah, uh, uh, mineral your, expenditure. About yes. your uh, biological minerals. Incredible. Incredible. There, there are a lot of case law out there. Obviously, time doesn't allow. We, we could go through. But I think what you find is people are incredibly aggressive in taking business expenses. That's the one area that they think if they have an argument that they have a business, you can certainly drive business expenses beyond the income if you qualify. So we see a lot of issues there. The other place that we see problems is in the itemized deductions. And the itemized deductions do include certain other business expenses. There was a case just this summer called, I, I can't remember what it's called, I apologize. I can find it if anybody wants it. But it was a professor at the University of Richmond. So you academias, here's an opportunity. So this guy made, I think, eighty or eighty-five thousand dollars a year. His wife worked at the library on campus. She made thirty-five thousand or forty thousand a year. So they made one hundred twenty-five, one hundred thirty thousand dollars gross. Three years in a row that were under under the case that were being argued in tax court, they had donated used clothing of about seventy thousand dollars a year. So it looked like when you look at the level of adjusted gross income, and this should be a clue to those of you that want to be aggressive on your tax returns, that you probably shouldn't be taking deductions equal to half or more of your actual total income. You know, the other part goes to taxes, and then you have $12,000 left to live on. But these people donated all of these clothing items, and all of the deductions were disallowed, uh, or, or most of it. The other thing they deducted on there were trade or business expenses. Because this guy was a professor at a university, his argument was that he's required to be more knowledgeable than the average human being, the average individual, because of his job. He's required to basically read more things on the internet and be, have a broader perspective of the world. So he deducted all his internet fees and all his internet monthly payments as business expenses to enhance his career position at the university. Uh, disallowed as well. So that's how that turned out. You can be comfortable at least if you're paying your own internet bill that this guy paid up to. Uh, the other deductions that we see, and, and itemized deductions, obviously, what do they comprise? Well, you know, state and local taxes, uh, lo uh, real estate taxes, investment interest expense, mortgage interest, uh, none of those leave a lot of room for a lot of abuse, so we don't see too many problems there or case cases on that, but there's a ton of them on the charitable contribution side, principally on, just as you would expect, non-cash charitable contributions. So we've all been in line at the Goodwill store where you pull up with a pickup truck full of all the junk from your garage and shed, you just dump it there, and then you take a $4,000 deduction. <laughs> That's a problem. <laughs> it's no longer allowed either, but historically it has been allowed. There's also, as Mike alluded to earlier, there's a casualty loss situation where if you have a sudden damage or a sudden uh, catastrophic event, there are certain amounts allowed as deductions, and we have a case, I believe, on on that as well. And then finally, like this Richmond College professor, in that case, unreimbursed business expenses. 
So those are the ones that, that are the primary drivers, which is the non-cash charitable contributions. Case law comes down constantly. The casualty losses and the unreimbursed employee, employee expenses. So Mike has a great case that has a casualty loss to give you kind of an example of how far you can take this. The thing you have to be thinking about when he goes over these cases is, who's paying for the professionals to take this to tax court? It's just unbelievable. But So uh, Mr. Roars here back in, uh, well, this case was in 2009. I think this actually occurred in 2006 out in California. Uh, this gentleman was going to a, uh, a party that he knew that there was going to be the uh, large consumption of alcohol, so he arranged for a ride. He shows up to the party, parties with his friends, and the ride takes him there, the ride takes him home, he goes home, he you know, sits down on his couch, he sleeps for a while, and then he gets up and he says, oh, I'm, I'm going to get in my truck and drive over to my parents' house. Well, as he's doing that, he um, crashes the truck, ends up on the, in a gutter somewhere, here come the police, you know, their sirens on, and lo and behold, he ends up getting a uh, DUI with respect to this because he, you know, there was still the uh, blood alcohol content in the system was 0.09, and in California at that point it was, the legal limit was 0.08, so he was just barely over that. Uh, so he had some 40-some, or 30-some thousand dollars in, in damage to his vehicle. He tried to turn that into his insurance company. They said, no, no, that violated the terms of our agreement since you were DUI, we're not going to reimburse you for that. So he says, well, okay, well, I have to pay 30 some thousand dollars to get my truck fixed, so I'll just take that as a casually lost deduction on my Schedule A. And you might be thinking, uh, well, that's kind of bizarre. You know, the rules on casualty losses are they have to be sudden, unexpected, unusual. I get that would, this would meet a lot of those, or all of those requirements, um, except for the fact that he actually caused this casualty uh, and so the, the court actually looked at, well, is there some way to actually reverse that casualty loss deduction? And what they looked at is, well, if you were actually willfully negligent in causing the actual casualty, then you couldn't take the casualty loss deduction. So what does willful negligence mean? I've got to read this because this is um, artistic beauty here in tax court. That actually means the exercise of so slight a degree of care as to raise a presumption of conscious indifference to the consequences, they went on to further say that that basically means, I don't care what happens. And the court analyzed the facts in this case, and they said, well, you know, originally he, um, he, he, he arranged for a ride. He thought he wasn't DUI. He was barely over the legal limit. And he actually argued that the, the consumption of alcohol didn't cause him to crash. It was actually the wind. And he won. And so he deducted that on his... Schedule A. I think the case would have been more interesting if he was driving a Ferrari. That'd be like four hundred thousand deduction. It was just a piece of junk Ford truck, I think. Yeah. Well, you know what? What's kind of interesting? Most of you aren't going to do that. Wreck your car to get the deduction. Well, some of you may, but most of you probably won't. So, but but the thing you can take away from that is you can use that when your spouse asks you why you didn't do something. You're not being willfully negligent. You're just being negligent. Yeah, that's right, negligent. <laughs> And then the last case we have to kind of share with you is this, this, again, an example of a medical expense, which, again, has a long history of abuse uh, by taxpayers in trying to get the maximum amount of deductions you can through an itemized deduction schedule. So Mr. Cherry kept going to the doctors for a number of years and finally was diagnosed with severe emphysema and bronchitis. And his doctor recommended that he exercise to kind of you know, help with these items. So he tried. Believe it or not, this was actually written in the case. He tried jogging, biking, and Canadian Air Force exercise. I'm not sure exactly what that is. Uh, and he also tried swimming. He liked swimming, so he, he, he tried it out a little bit, and um, you know, it helped alleviate his medical concerns. The problem is that he actually ran a garment company. He had a difficult schedule. He was there early in the morning, uh, late at night, so he went to his local Y. He went to a community center. Uh, he investigated uh, putting a pool on his current property. Not, none of those would work for him. So he just decided to build a whole new house. And as part of that, he put a new swimming pool as an addition onto his house. And he argued that you know, the construction of the pool, the maintenance, the, everything that goes into that uh, should be deducted as a medical expense. And it really wasn't personal in nature. The IRS had a number of arguments here to make. They actually took a look at the pool and they said, well, if this is really as, to be taken as a medical expense, then why is the pool sloped from a 
a, sh a shallow end to a deep end. That sounds like maybe you might have a diving board there. And they did have a diving board. They had a diving board at the end of the pool. They said, well, how could this really be a medical expense? This is really just like a, a personal expense. His wife used the pool a little bit. His kids had parties there. But he was able to argue that he was the predominant user of that pool. And he tried out so many different ways of exercise, and none of them worked. And this was the only way that he could you know, alleviate his medical concerns. Um, and so everything associated with that pool was deductible on his Schedule A. So you get his kind of picture of Michael Phelps, right, taking that as, no, maybe. Yeah, for him it might be a, uh, a, a, a viable expenditure, I guess, in some ways. So, I mean, that was just a, a quick look for your tax planning. I know you have Thanksgiving coming up. I know you have Christmas coming up. Nothing's more important than putting all this planning together for these tax returns for next year. You want to take as big a deductions as you can, and then when you're done, call Don Johnston because he'll help get you out of trouble. He tells me that the best case he ever has is every one that he gets away without going to jail. So he's the guy to call if you need any assistance. So with that, I'll, I'll call up uh, John and Jeff, uh, my partner Steve and Melissa, and uh, we'll pull these names and uh, get this thing going. Don, you coming up? Again, we appreciate you coming today. This is the 16th time we've done this. Uh, we appreciate your attendance. It's a great day for us, and I, I hope it's an enjoyable day for you.